Hello again, everyone. Welcome to this edition of Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We're in 2 Thessalonians. We pick up our study in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. We finished up with verse 8 last time. So get your Bible, if you can, open it up to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and we will give, uh, I'll give you a minute while I tell you about the Scripture Verse by Verse website, which is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. You cannot go wrong going to Scripture to the Scripture Verse by Verse website. You can't go wrong because it's all the Word of God. That's it. If you don't have a hunger for the Word of God, start studying the Word of God because that will whet your appetite for more of God's Word, and it'll bless you. And it'll sanctify you. And it'll help you get to heaven. It'll help you to live the kind of life that Jesus wants. It'll preserve your faith. If you have a love for the Word of God, well, then there's no better place on earth than the Scripture Verse by Verse website. And I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about the Word of God because I've gone through it and I've taught it in its entirety, verse by verse, from Genesis through Revelation, three complete times. If you haven't started a verse-by-verse study through the Bible, do it today. Today. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. And I want to go back and I want to begin reading in chapter 1, verse 6. And it says, For it is a righteous thing with God to recompense with tribulation those who trouble you. And I know this is review, but that's okay. What he is saying is that you're suffering for Christ. You're suffering for remaining true to God's word. And in the case of preachers, your suffering, your sacrifice remaining for remaining true and proclaiming the clear word of God without watering it down to be popular will be worth it. God is fair. He's going to take care of those who oppose you. He's going to take care of those who oppose him. That's God's business, not yours. Your business is to live for Jesus. My business is to live for Jesus and to teach God's word. God's business is to take care of the results and to take care of those who oppose the pure word of God. <clears throat> For it is a righteous thing with God to recompense with tribulation those who trouble you and to, and to you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. When Jesus returns, he is returning with his mighty angels. And he's got a job to do. And it's not to show mercy. Not to sinners. Not anymore. That's why he came the first time. Not the second time. Notice what it says in 7 and 8. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who know not God and who obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. To obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is to repent of your sin and to ask Jesus Christ to come into your life to be your Lord and Savior. If you don't do that, then on the last day, whether you're alive or dead, it doesn't matter. You're going to be raised, and you will stand before him. And as he says right here, in flaming fire, he will take vengeance on those who know not God. And that's a synonym for those who have rejected Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. He will take vengeance on you with flaming fire. Hell 
is flaming fire. You know, this is pure word of God. Thank God for the Apostle Paul. Thank God for preachers like Paul. God needs preachers like the Apostle Paul, who were not afraid to, to speak the plain truth of God's word. He need, need, needs preachers like John the Baptist, like the Apostle Paul, like Peter, like Elijah, like Elisha, like Jeremiah, like Isaiah, like all of those Old Testament prophets who were so faithful. <clears throat> and man needs preachers like the Apostle Paul and the rest of them as well. Whether they like it or not, whether they like them or not, it doesn't matter. Man needs preachers like that. Mankind needs preachers. Christians need preachers. And Bible teachers who will proclaim the pure word of God without fear, without any regards to what might happen to them. Because man left to himself will fall into spiritual destruction Man left to himself will fall into spiritual corruption and at the end, ruin. That's what happens when man is left to themselves. You can mark my words. You can take this to the bank. You need the governing of God's holy word. You need the spirit of Almighty God and the word of Almighty God implanted in your soul every single day day to dig out the corruption that has entered in sometimes unawares through the world the flesh and the devil and so if you're too busy for the word of god then you are way too busy way too busy and you need to get rid of whatever it is that occupies your mind and your life and keeps you so busy that you don't have time to spend with God in his word every single day. Because I will tell you this, that attitude will destroy you. Jesus Christ is coming, or you'll go to be with him. You'll go to see him, and when you see him, if you're not ready, if you're not right, if you haven't repented, if there's someone or something in this life that has kept you from repenting and receiving Christ as Lord and Savior, it doesn't matter whether you go to him or he comes here, he is going to meet you and there will be vengeance in his eyes and he will show his anger by throwing you into the flames of hell. It is going to happen. It is going to happen. You can mark it. You can believe it because Jesus talked about it an awful lot. If you don't have time for God's word, if you have a take it or leave it attitude when it comes to repentance and submitting to the lordship of Jesus Christ, that attitude is going to destroy you. It's going to ruin you. It's going to corrupt you. It's going to, it's going to lead your soul to hell. And if that isn't enough, it'll lead your children's soul to hell too if they follow suit. And so often they do. And if that doesn't move you, if that doesn't bother you, then you are a cold, corrupt, dead soul and dead spirit and you deserve to burn in hell. Just look at what the Bible says here. Just look at it. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who know not God. You say, well, that's where you, that's where you are wrong, Moret, because I go to church and I'm really involved. I do a lot of things. Who cares? What does that have to do with anything? On the last day, Jesus has already told us what he is going to say to many people. When they give him that worn out all ex old excuse, but Lord, we did miracles in your name and we prayed in your name and we did many works in your name. Lots of stuff in your name because we call ourselves a Christian. And he's going to look at him. He's going to say, depart from me into everlasting fire 
prepared for the devil and his angels because I never knew you. <clears throat> you can go to church, doesn't matter. You can go to church without knowing Jesus. You can serve in church without knowing Jesus. If you've never been broken over your sin, if you've never fallen on your knees and asked Jesus Christ to come into your life and sincerely with everything that you've got, asked him to take control to be the Lord of your life and wash away all your sins and be your Lord and be your Savior, you're not saved. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who know not God and who obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus came the first time to save, and that's what he's been doing for 2,000 years. He's coming the second time to punish every single person who has refused to repent, who has treated his mercy that he purchased at such a high price on the cross as a, as a common thing, as a thing to be rejected. He will punish them with fiery vengeance. Verse 8 and 9. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who know not God and who obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Jesus ought to know. He made the place. Jesus created everything including hell for the devil and his angels. And according to Jesus, hell is fire. According to Jesus, hell is horrible. According to Jesus, hell is painful beyond our ability to even grasp. According to Jesus, hell is thirst. Hell is weeping, it is torment, it is wailing, it is gnashing of teeth, and it is everlasting. According to Jesus, hell is everlasting. Take your finger, turn the burner on your stove up high, and take your finger and put it on that burner and see how loud you scream. And see how fast you run to the water faucet and turn that thing on ice cold and run cool water over it. That's one finger placed in the fire. Think of hell. Jesus said hell is a place of burning, torment, never ending. It's it's everlasting. And it's not just your finger. Think of the horrible pain of putting your finger on a burner. Now imagine your whole body engulfed in that same flame, in that same fire, in that same hot. Your body would, would normally char and die under conditions like that, but it won't. Because you are immortal and you will have an immortal body even in hell. You will feel every ounce of pain forever and ever and ever. It will never stop. The burning, the screaming, the tormenting, it won't end. You will suffer so much, you can't even imagine it. And all because you have sinned, and worse yet, rejected God's mercy through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what he is talking about right here. Hell is God's just punishment for those who would sin against him. And then on top of that, refuse his gracious offering of mercy through his son, Jesus Christ. And notice... Those are the people who go to hell. Everything rises and falls on what we do with Jesus. The other religions, just forget about it. 
Islam, forget about it. Hinduism, forget about it. New Age thing, just forget about it. Hare Krishna, just forget about it. They're all lies of the devil to get you distracted from the real issue, which is Jesus. You tell me one other person who started a religion, as it were, if you want to call Christianity that, who died and rose again three days later to prove that what he did on the cross was pay for sins and then to proclaim the gospel of how you are saved and we have it right here. It's never been done before. It's never been done since. It's never going to be done again. Jesus did it all. He's the one Savior, the one way to avoid hell, which is why God says, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who know not God and who obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't say anything about not obeying Islam. It doesn't say that God's going to take vengeance on, on those who won't obey Islam, those who won't obey Hare Krishna, those who won't follow Buddha. It doesn't say anything about those. Because the one true God is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one true God who created you and who is your judge also sent his son to die on the cross to pay for your sin so that you wouldn't have to experience the flaming vengeance of his son when he returns this time as judge, not as savior. It's up to you. But I'm telling you the truth. Whether you listen or not, that's totally up to you. 9 and 10. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction. I told you, hell, is last, hell lasts forever. Jesus said it lasts forever too. There's no end to it. That burning, that burning. You know, one time, I used to make neon signs. And one time, I grabbed with my hand. I will never forget it. I grabbed with my hand a piece of hot glass, a tube that had just that I just took out of the fire. And for some reason, I just, I just forgot that I just took it out of the fire and I grabbed it. And I had one, two, one, I had three, no, four, 12, 15, 17, 18 burns on my hands. 18. My, I could feel my skin literally crawl. It melted. The pain was so horrible, and there's nothing you can do for that. I walked around in my workshop. I clenched my fist. Every, every muscle in my body was clenched. The pain was so severe, and I walked around, and I walked around until after I don't know how long that intense burning pain finally eased up, but I couldn't do anything. I couldn't function. I couldn't think. But in hell, it never subsides. It never goes away. And it's infinitely worse than what I experienced for that half hour or whatever it was. The pain is infinitely worse. It's everlasting. It never goes away. Are you going to tell me that some sin that you're committed is worth that? Are you out of your mind? You say, well, I'll take my chances. You're a fool. God is not a man that he should lie. Or a son of man that he should change his mind. When he shall come on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. We're going to, those of us who are saved, when we die, or if we're still alive when Jesus returns, we're going to admire Jesus. We're going to glorify him. We're going to praise him. We're going to admire him. No matter how close we may have been to Jesus in this life, we will still be in awe of him when we see him in person. One look at those nail-scarred hands, and I know I am going to fall on my face and probably weep my eyes out thanking him for saving me from hell. One glimpse of Christ, and we're going to be on our face. And when we finally get the nerve to look up, we're going to be speechless in his presence. Especially when we see 
the horrible fate of those who rejected him. And we see that it could have been us and it should have been us, but it won't be us because we turned away from our sin and we asked Jesus Christ to be our Lord and our Savior. <coughs> Verse 11, Therefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. Doing the work of faith, doing the work of faith will result in God counting us worthy of the kingdom of God. As Paul has already said in verse 5, doing the work of faith is going to cause God to look at us and say, you are worthy of entering into the kingdom of God. Do you have any idea what this means? If you're sitting under a lot of teaching today in modern evangelicalism, you've never heard this. But I'm going to tell you what it means. Doing the work of faith is what God, doing the work of faith is what will cause God to say you are worthy of entering into my kingdom now that you are dead. Now that my son has returned, which means this, those who don't live for Jesus, and I don't care if you call yourself a Christian or not, those who don't live for Jesus, those who sin and don't confess, Jesus said those who love the world and the things of this world, the love of God is not in them. So for those who are enamored with the world, Christian or non-Christian, it doesn't matter. Those who sin and don't confess, those who sin and don't repent, those who try to be cool in the eyes of the world, those who deny Jesus Christ in times of persecution, the moment the heat is on, oh boy, you back off and you got to be cool in the eyes of the world because you don't want anybody to get upset with you. You don't want to be rejected. You poor baby. Jesus was despised and rejected of man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and he asked us to follow suit by living for him. He said, all who live godly lives in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And he also said, he who endures to the end shall be saved. If you do not, if you reject Jesus Christ because of persecution or discomfort or because you don't like being rejected, then you're going to find yourself excluded from the kingdom of God. And there's only one other place. And it's what he talked about back in verse 8. Flames. Because the faith that changes a sinner's destination also changes their behavior. That's why he said, those who do the work of faith. Faith is how you get saved. But saving faith works. Read the book of James. Saving faith works. And those who do the work of faith, those who are genuinely saved by faith and have the Spirit of God living inside of them because they are truly saved, will do works that follow faith. Works that proceed from what they believe, which is that Jesus is Lord and Savior and the Word of God is the Word of God. And those who do the works of faith have saving faith because the faith that saves your soul from hell is also a faith that will change your behavior. You don't do the things that you used to do. You don't want to do the things that you used to do. You don't have the same attitude that you used to have about sin. Not if you're saved. You don't live in the spiritual gutter. You can slip. You can fall into the spiritual gutter, but you're not going to live in it. And if you do, you're not saved. Verse 12. 
that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may, may be glorified in you, and ye in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. See, Jesus is going to receive glory from the faith of a Christian if that faith is genuine. And that's because real faith will do will do good. Real faith will do what is good in the eyes of God. Real faith cares about Jesus. See? The Bible says, to those of us who believe, Christ is precious. If you truly have faith in Jesus Christ, if you truly have, have been saved because you have, with all of your heart, repented and asked Jesus Christ to come into your life to be your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit has come to live inside of you and that is the Spirit of Jesus and there will be a love for Jesus in you. It'll be there. The Holy Spirit testifies to our spirit that we are children of God, the Bible says. You are going to have a love for Jesus because you will know that he died on the cross to pay for your sins. You will know that you're not going to hell. You will know that your sins are washed away. You will know that you're going to heaven. You will know that Jesus did it all. You're going to have a love for Jesus. If you don't love Jesus, you're not saved. If he's not the most important thing to you, then you're not saved. A real faith that a real Christian has cares about Jesus. A real faith cares about Jesus. Not because of the goodness of the one who has the faith, but by the enabling grace of God, working through the Spirit of God, who lives in the soul of that human being. So don't go saying that Moret's teaching that you work your way to heaven by being good, because I didn't say that. And that's not true. And don't say that Moret <coughs> teaches that you have to build up a love for Jesus in order to be saved. I didn't say that. That's not true. I said a real faith. I'm telling you what the Bible says. I'm not going beyond what is written. I'm telling you a real saved person with real faith in Jesus Christ will have the real Holy Spirit of God in them. And he, in that person, will be responsible for the love that that person has for Jesus. They will be doing the work of faith. They will not be worldly. They will not be living like the world. They will not be enamored with the world. They won't be looking at things the way they used to. Sin will be repulsive to them. Holiness is what their goal will be. If that's not you, you better fall on your knees right now and repent of all your sin and get serious with Jesus because you are on thin ice and it's not worth it. Don't roll the dice with your immortal soul or you will be sorry. To study more of God's word, go to thebibleversebyverse.com because you can study the Bible from Genesis through Revelation, every single verse, three complete series spanning 30 years of teaching, three complete series going through the Bible. Start in Genesis, go through Revelation, or pick whatever book you want to study Click on it, click the chapter, just bring your open Bible. Study the Word of God. Remember, we need the restraining power of God's Word. We need it because left to ourselves, we're going to go in the wrong direction. And if you want to be a part of this ministry, you can be with your prayers and financial support. Remember, we are brought to you by those prayers and financial support. Never been underwritten by a large church or denomination. Never, never, never. In 30 years, this has been a faith ministry. I teach the Word of God as I taught it today, and I trust that people who love God's Word will want to be a part of it 
stand shoulder to shoulder with me and get out God's word. Until next time, so long, everyone.